Hi, Pastor Matt here. Thank you so much for um, either streaming or downloading this sermon. I, I pray that every week you're challenged by the Word of God. You're, you're built up in His love. The Word of God kind of gets in you and rearranges things and draws your affections up to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I want to remind you, as always, uh, that although, man, I'm I'm so glad that that you want to hear what what I've got to say this week or we've got to say this week. Th this is never never meant to substitute God's good plan for you to be in a community of faith where the word of God is preached and proclaimed. And so I wanna encourage you to use this like a vitamin, not like a meal, uh, so that you belong to a community of faith where you're being shaped by being known, by using your gifts, by receiving the word, by partaking in the sacraments, and by walking faithfully in accordance with the scriptures. And then this is something, man, you're listening to while you run or you're, you're watching when you have a few minutes. And so just wanna make sure we, we frame what this is and what it should not be. Now, with that said, uh, one of the things that the Village Church wants to do is the things that are created here by the grace of God, man, we wanna give those away. That's podcasts and vodcasts, that's family discipleship curriculum, that's Bible study curriculum, like what we've, what we've tried to do for over a decade is just whatever we create here, we wanna give away. And so to do that though, we rely on the donations and generosity of those who, who believe in what we're doing and who have benefited from the things that have been created here. And so here, before you dive into what I'm sure is gonna be a 45, 50 minute uh, sermon, uh, I just wanted to encourage you, if you have grown, if you have benefited um, from our resources, would you consider being a part of the team that helps this engine continue uh, to produce and create biblical, creative, and practical discipleship curriculum uh, for men and women of all ages and all stations? And so, man, if you'd pray about that and consider that, um, that, would, that would be amazing. Thank you so much. Enjoy the word of God proclaimed. Amen. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good. Hey, for those of you who don't know me and maybe for those of you who do, my name is JT. It's my privilege to serve as one of the pastors here at The Village. Uh, we've been in a sermon series over the course of the summer. So whether this is your first week, you've been with us all summer. We've been in the Psalms for the last 12 or 13 weeks. And today is our final day in this sermon series on the Psalms. So we're going we're gonna to spend our time in the very last Psalm in the Psalter, Psalm 150. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and grab it. If you don't have one, there should be one in the seat in front of you. And the psalm will also be up on the screen if, uh, if you're just lazy and you want to look at the screen, which is fine too. So Psalm 150, here's why I love this psalm. What we're going to learn today is that this psalm is going to teach us what it looks like to live a life of worship. What does it look like to live a life of love and adoration and of affection of God and God alone? That's what Psalm 150. 50 is about. So I'll begin reading in verse 1. The psalmist writes this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary and praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's the end of the book of Psalms. And so what I need to do now before we go into the sermon, I need to enter into a verbal agreement with each of you. I can handle a lot of things. If anybody gets up here on the stage and starts banging a cymbal, I'm not going to know what to do. Uh, so this is, this is like a flight attendant. You know the flight attendant on the exit row is like, can we get through the sermon before we do clanging cymbals? I need a verbal agreement. Can we say yes? Yes, thank you. We're on the same page. Uh, and if not, I'm going to give your children symbols on the way home, and they're going to bang them in your house. So here's what I want you to see. The main point of this psalm is helping us answer the question, what is it like to live a life of worship? It's going to help answer some questions for us. It's going to answer five questions in particular. The first question is this, who do we worship? The second question is, where do we worship? The third is, why do we worship? The fourth is, how do we worship? And the fifth is, who is invited to worship? Who do we worship? Where do we worship? Why do we worship? How do we worship? And fifth and finally, who is invited to worship? So the first question I want us to think about that Psalm 150 addressed, addresses is, who do we 
worship. The thing that I love about Psalm 150 is that it's intentionally placed at the end of the book of Psalms. It's 150 out of 149. And the the people, the men and women who compile this book and, and pull together all of Israel's prayers and meditations do something very intentional by placing this psalm at the very end of the book. You see, the book of Psalms is 149 different psalms, different genres, different seasons of life, different things are going on in the different authors of the psalms. Things like depression, darkness, despair. You'll hear David, who is one of the psalmists, say things like, where is God in all of this? How much longer are our enemies going to reign victoriously over us? And when is God going to bring us justice? You'll also hear David in the next psalm say things like, we revel and bask and enjoy your presence. There's nothing that makes us happier. You've heard some of us talk about him kind of having like a schizophrenia, right? Because he's experiencing all of life and he's putting it in the psalms. You see, sometimes I think we treat the psalms like a, like a prayer magic eight ball, like we're just going to kind of you know, grab a psalm and turn it open and see what God has for us. But really, the psalms are telling us how they, they're intimately aware about how gritty and complex our lives are, that they're hard and challenging and complex and difficult. It is aware of every single human experience. It's aware of the joy that you have, this this unimaginable joy that you can't even learn how to, you don't even know how to express it with words or thoughts or actions. But it's also aware of death and darkness and depression and, and fear and anxiety. The Psalms aren't afraid of exposing the deepest realities of our human condition. And so what we've just had is these 149 psalms, not generic prayers, but real life songs, reminding us of what what it's like to be a human. And you get to Psalm 150. And the people who put it together are trying to get us to see something intentional. They're trying to see that after all of it, through all of it, and in all of it, that the greatest purpose for which we were made was to praise God. That whatever season you're walking through, whatever challenge or difficulty, whether it's joyful or whether it's sorrowful, it all eventually leads us to say, praise the Lord. Praise him in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him according to his wonderful and miraculous deeds and praise him according to his excellent greatness. So my greatest hope for you this morning is to see that the Psalms can deal with every single part of our lives and all of it will eventually lead to praise Who do we worship? Look at the first verse again. The psalmist says this, praise the Lord. To be human is to worship. You worship something. You love something. Your your adoration and your affections are directed to something. You see, you don't get to choose whether or not you are going to worship. The question is, What do you worship? You see, the most important question that you might ever ask and answer is this question. What do you love? What do you love? Like, what gets you fired up? What gets you excited? What satisfies the deepest parts of your soul, the deepest parts of your heart? You see, to be human is to be a lover. It is to worship. Paul talks about this in his letter to the Romans, or to the letter to the church in Rome, in Romans chapter one. He says this, it'll be on the screen. This is chapter one, verses 18 to 25. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So Paul's saying, you love something but you suppress the thing that is most lovable or the thing that is most lovely. Verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God's shown it to them. His invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in these things that have been made. So we are without excuse for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. Look at the end of this verse and their foolish hearts were darkened. Our foolish hearts are darkened. You were made to worship. You were made to love. But our hearts have been darkened. We we have disordered loves. We, We love the things we shouldn't love, and we don't love the things we should love. Verse 22, claiming to be wise, we became fools. We exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, animals, creeping things. Therefore... 
God gave them up in their lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And here, catch this, worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So the Bible is getting very real with us this morning. It knows that you and I love things. It knows that you and I were created to worship and give adoration and praise and to be satisfied in the things that we worship. But it's also describing a reality for us where we always, by nature and default, according to Romans 1, praise and worship the wrong thing. So the psalmist is saying, praise, praise, but it's not enough just to worship. Because left to our own senses or our our default nature, we would always worship and praise the wrong things. You see, the thing that's scary for me about a passage like this is I know that it's true of me. I know that I love and worship the wrong things sometimes, but I can't remember the time when I decided to do it. Does that make sense? Like I just did it. Like, Like my heart is bent in on itself. That my loves and my my, my worship is disordered by nature, that I find things lovely that I shouldn't find lovely, and the things that I do find lovely, I don't find lovely. This is what Paul then says in Romans chapter 7, that we are bent in on ourselves. Uh, Augustine calls it heart sclerosis, that our hearts have a disease, and it's the disease of self-love. This disease that we love the things that we shouldn't love and we don't love the things that we should love. So here's what I want you to see. The great problem of our disease, of our condition is this, is that we don't love the things we should. But you were created to love. You were created to worship. So if all of life is worship, then then the question must be, what do we worship and what do we love? And the psalmist is trying to direct our attention to the one thing that is most lovely. He says, Praise the Lord. You see, you don't get to decide whether or not you're going to love. The question is, what is the object of your love? What is the object of your worship and your affection? I love that the psalmist here, he doesn't just use a generic name for God. You see, the Hebrew Old Testament, when it says the Lord like this, it's not just, it's not just some random king or some random God. The Lord is God's personal name, Yahweh. This is the name that God uses himself to, to meet Moses in in the, the burning bush, and he says, I am who I am. So, so the psalmist is saying, love the God who has come personally to you in Yahweh. I love how R.C. Sproul talks about this when he says this. He says, it is the imperative, it is imperative that every Christian, at the beginning of our pursuit to understand what true worship is or what, what true life is about, that we get very, very clear about the object of our worship because it's to be God and God alone. You see, this word praise occurs 13 times in six verses. And every single time it has an object. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise him, praise him, praise him. Praise the Lord. This refrain is repeated over and over and over again. So one of the first things I want you to learn this morning is this, that the greatest truth about God, according to Psalm 150, is that he is worthy of worship. That's the greatest truth about God, that he is worthy of your worship. The greatest truth about you is that you were made to worship him. So two important truths. God alone is worthy of worship. You were created to worship him. But sin reverses that relationship. That's what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 1. You are never more self-aware than when you are worshiping God. Because when you worship God, the relationship exists in the right relationship. You're seeing him for who he is. You're seeing you for who you are. But you're never more self-deceived than when you're worshiping something else. You're never more self-aware than you when you exist in a worshipful relationship of the triune God, but you're never more self-deceived when you love or worship something else. When we understand these truths, we begin to understand why we were made and why we exist. One of my favorite teaching documents from a few centuries ago, it's called the Westminster Catechism, opens up with this line. It asks the question, what is the chief end of man? Why do we exist? Why are we here? And it starts with how Psalm 150 starts. It says, we're here to glorify God and enjoy him forever. 
Like, that's it. What's your life passion? What's the goal of all of this? The psalmist is saying everything is on this trajectory, this goal, this tell us that all of life is moving us towards praise the Lord. Worship him and enjoy him alone forever. That's the first question. Who do we worship? God and God alone. The second question is this, where? Where should we be worshiping God? Look back at the text. It says, praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. You see, the Bible uses this term sanctuary very loosely. Sometimes the Garden of Eden, Genesis 1 and 2, is described as a sanctuary. Sometimes the tabernacle is described as a sanctuary. This is this temporary tent that God lived and moved around in. He's also, it also describes the temple as a sanctuary. But you know what else is described as a sanctuary? Every single part of God's creation. Every part. Every single blade of grass, every single star, every single grain of sand is God's dwelling place, is his sanctuary. And then it also says, praise him in his mighty heavens. So what the psalmist is trying to tell you when you're asking the question, okay, God alone is worthy of praise, that's who I worship, but where do I worship? The psalmist is saying everywhere. That we don't have the opportunity to compartmentalize where we worship God. That we don't just worship God on Sunday morning when we gather, or Wednesday night when we come to a study, or on Tuesday night when we're in our home group worshiping God. The psalmist is saying all of creation belongs to God, therefore he will be worshiped in all of creation. But one of the things that's true for us in a contemporary society, in a, a post-Christian culture, is that we're try, we try to compartmentalize God to certain parts of our life or certain parts of our world. That by nature, we think we, it's easy for us to love God on Sunday morning, but it's a lot harder for us to love God on Monday morning in the boardroom. It's easy to love God when you're going through a great study with your home group and you're sharing prayer requests. It's a lot harder to love God, perhaps, if you have a, a challenging marriage. But the psalmist is saying there is literally no part of God's creation or a part of your life that is off limits to God. You see, we've got to get rid of this strange, sacred, and secular divide. Everything belongs to God, therefore he will be worshipped everywhere. You see, the disease of cultural Christianity is this disease that we believe we can compartmentalize Christianity to a part of our life, not all of our life. Maybe it's better to say it this way. We believe we can compartmentalize our loves, which actually shows what we believe about God. It believes that we think God is a commodity to be rationed, not an inexhaustible well that satisfies. Do you realize you could never praise God enough? Do you realize that? Like, you never can praise him enough because he's that beautiful. He's that lovely. He's that worthy of our adoration and affection. So the psalmist is, is begging us and imploring us that this is the end to which all of creation is moving. Praise the Lord. Praise him everywhere. Derek Kidner says it this way. He says, his glory fills the universe. His praise must do no less. You see, we may be living in a post-Christian world, but we're never going to live in a post-God world. He is worthy of praise everywhere and one day he will be worshipped everywhere. So yes, it's right, it's right for us to gather and sing and pray and read and worship God together here, but ultimately the psalmist is saying, this is just a rehearsal of us bringing praise and glory to God everywhere. So if you are in a relationship with Christ, your life has no limits to him. You no longer have the freedom, according to Psalm 150, to compartmentalize your life and your love. So the first question was, who do we worship? We worship God. The second, where do we worship? We worship everywhere. And third, why? Look at verse two. Praise him for his mighty deeds and praise him according to his excellent greatness. So the psalmist says we have two reasons to praise God. Why do we praise him? Two reasons. First, mighty deeds. We praise God for what he has done. We praise him because he's accomplished thing in History. So the psalmist is pointing Israel back to their history, to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to God's promises and his acts of salvation on their behalf. He's pointing them back to the scriptures, that they would know what God has done on their behalf so that they could praise and worship him. And he points them to his excellent greatness. I don't know about you, but life is a funny thing, isn't it? 
Like life circumstances can change quickly. You can go from having the best day of your life to the worst quickly and sometimes hour to hour. You never know when the diagnosis is going to come. For some of us, maybe it came this week. You never know when you're going to get the good news of maybe having a baby or getting that job promotion. Life is just a funny thing. It's complex and it's gritty and it's hard and it's challenging. So I don't know about you, but it's easy for me to begin looking at the circumstances of my life, looking around and allowing my circumstances to dictate whether or not I praise and worship God. You follow me? Like, it's easy for us to look around at, at what, what, what's going on in our family or what's going on in our kids or what's going on for ourselves. or I didn't get the job that I thought I was going to get or I feel like I'm being you know, unjustly attacked at work. Whatever it might be, like, life is hard and it's complex and it's so easy to allow our circumstances to dictate whether or not we're going to offer praise to God. But what the psalmist is showing us here in this verse is that we don't allow our circumstances to dictate praise. We allow God's character to fuel our praise. Right? We're not looking around wondering when the next shoe is going to drop in our life. Our eyes are always invited up into God's excellent greatness. Our circumstances don't dictate our praise. His greatness fuels our praise. The psalmist is telling us that the, the reason we don't worship, like if you feel stifled today in worship, it's not because of your circumstances. It's because you're forgetting God's character. If you're stifled in worship today, if your heart is not lifting itself up into the heavens with God, it's not because of your circumstances, it's because you've, you've forgotten his mighty deeds on your behalf. See, some of you remember that Macy and I, my wife, walked through a difficult season last year. It was the hardest year of our life by far. Most of you know, the first thing I want to say, I just want to try to remind you guys and thank you for all that you guys did for us that, that year. So uh, I said this in the last service, so I'll say it here. One of the most beautiful things in the Christian life is Christians loving one another and caring for one another. From Memorial Day weekend through past Labor Day weekend, five nights a week, we never made a meal for ourselves because this church provided dinner for us every single week. And I had non-believers all around me saying, what in the world? Do you know these people? And I was like, I know some of them, but this is the church. And God draws near to his people through his people. And so I, every time I get a chance to say thank you again, I want to say thank you because you demonstrated the love of Christ to me and other people saw it and it was awesome. But you remember the situation we were walking through. We were walking through a really difficult time where, where we thought my wife had, had cancer. So we walk into a doctor's office and, and he says, is the high-grade sarcoma? Uh, if it is what we think it is, she has a 50 to 70% chance of living five years from now. And if she's living, we're taking her leg, hip, and pelvis. That was within the first 90 seconds of my appointment with a doctor. You want to talk about a life gut punch and circumstances leading to praise or a lack of praise? I've, I, I couldn't breathe. I had so much anxiety. I felt like my heart couldn't beat anymore. As we found out, though, it was a misdiagnosis. Well, it's possible God healed her, which would be awesome. It's also possible it was a misdiagnosis. Do you want to know how much I care which one's which? Zero <laughs> percent. Because, because God's great. And it could, it could be either. The, the, the great news is, is that she's, she's healthy and that she's good. But we met with oncologists and radiologists that week as they were doing pathology reports and trying to figure out exactly what it was after they gave us the original diagnosis of cancer. I remember, I remember asking the doctor when we were in the hospital room, I said, here's a knife, can you cut it open now? Like, let's get this thing out. Because when you're in that moment, you're like, get it out now. I don't wanna wait, I don't want a pathology report. If there's a chance she's gonna die from this, get it out. And he says, actually, it's really important that we diagnose this the right way. Because if we, if we misdiagnose this, if we misdiagnose her uh, illness, we're going to mistreat it. And if we mistreat it, we're not going to heal it. We're actually going to cause a greater problem. Right? So one thing that I want to talk to you about this morning is that right now, the church, we have a discipleship disease. We have a, a, a lack of praise in the life of the church. A lack of seeing God for who he is and remembering his mighty deeds and, and praising him for his excellent greatness. But we've, I believe we've been misdiagnosing the disease and therefore mistreating it. You see, we've been told that the reason we have a praise deficit is because we know a God that we don't praise. But the psalmist is saying something entirely different. He's saying our problem isn't that we know a God that we don't praise, it's that we're trying to praise a God that we don't know. Follow me here. Our greatest problem as it relates to giving God honor, glory, and praise isn't that we know him and don't praise him. It's that we're trying to praise a God that we don't know. Because the psalmist is saying, if you knew his mighty deeds on your behalf, if you were regularly in the scriptures reminding yourself of what God has done in the life of Israel at the cross of Jesus Christ and in your life, 
you could not help but regularly be on your knees giving honor, glory, and adoration to God. He's also saying, if you simply are aware of the beauty of his majesty, of his excellent greatness, of his providential control over every single part of creation, you could not help but fall on your face in praise and adoration. Our problem is not that we know a God that we don't love. It's that we're trying to love a God that we don't know. So part of discipleship, part of fueling our life for praise is reminding ourselves of what God has done for you of reminding ourselves of how great he is, that he has excellent greatness. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him for his excellent greatness. I believe true knowledge of God always leads us to a desperate adoration of God. True knowledge of what he's done for us, his mighty deeds and his excellent greatness is few, should fuel our praise and worship of God. So who do we worship? God and God alone. Where do we worship? Everywhere. Third, why do we worship? Because of who he is and what he does. And fourth, how do we worship? Look back at verse three and five and remember your verbal agreement. (laughs) Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. A lot of people will use a text like this to to talk about what is an appropriate instrument to use in a worship service. That's to totally misunderstand what the psalmist is trying to say. What the psalmist is trying to get us to see is this. Whatever instrument's in your hand, use it. What tool do you have? Praise God with it. Do you've got a lute? Great. You've got a harp? Great. You've got clashing cymbals? Great. You've got generosity? Great. You've got hospitality? Great. What tool, what instrument has God given you to worship him? Use it. Nothing is off limits. That's why I keep trying to tell Michael and Grant that I would love to be in the praise and worship band, but they have not given me a chance yet. (laughs) See, I think one of the reasons we don't use our gifts is sometimes what happens in our heart is this heart of covetousness. We want somebody else's gift or tool or instrument. You see, if I had the gift of teaching, well, then I could be up on the stage teaching. If I had the gift of playing a guitar, or if I had the gift of whatever, if I knew how to play the lute or the harp or the lyre or the cymbals, well, then I could praise God. If only I had a different instrument, tool, or gift. But what the psalmist is saying is that God has given you an instrument in your life to bring praise and worship to him and nothing's off limits. But for so many of us, these tools sit on the shelf, but there's no instrument in our lives that can't bring worship to God. So if it's hospitality, praise him with your house. If it's generosity, praise him with your money or your time. If it's singing, praise him with your voice. If it's service, praise him with your hands. You know who's praising right now? 50 Little Village volunteers who are teaching kids the gospel. Praise the Lord. So this psalm is saying praise God alone. Praise him everywhere. Praise him because of his mighty deeds and his excellent greatness. Praise him with everything that's available to you. Any tool or instrument in your life, praise him with it. So the final question is this. Who is invited to worship? Who is supposed to be the ones enacting this worship of God? Look at verse six. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know what the Greek translation for everything is? Everything. That's the end of the world. The end of the Psalms and the book of Revelation end the same. Everything will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everybody will. Everything will, we're told. I love this, how this word breath is used here. This bre- the word breath, that everything that has breath, is, it's such an interesting word to use here. Why not let, let every creature, let every, breath is this word that is kind of laced throughout the biblical story, and I want you to see it real quick. This word breath is laced from Genesis to Revelation, showing us this story of praise and this story of worship from beginning to end. You think of Genesis chapter two, where where God has formed Adam and Eve up out of the dust and he's creating them. They're built up into a humanity. And Genesis 2, seven says this. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils. What does that say? The breath of life. 
And the man became a living creature. So the very foundation of the entire story of the Bible is that a creator God created us and gave us the breath of life so that we might do what? Worship him with our breath. So that every single part of our capacity of our lungs and every single part of our life would be this this breath of God worshiping the one who made us, who gave us the breath of life. But a similar word here is used to describe Jesus on the cross in Mark 15. Mark 15 says this, and when it was the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Again, Jesus is on the cross, and he, he cries out with a voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Genesis 2, the breath of life in our lungs, and now a new Adam hanging on a cross in a new garden saying, where are you, God? Why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders hear it, and they say, is, this, is he calling Elijah? And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. This one who created breath is now thirsty and he's, he's coming out of breath. It says, wait, let's see if he's going to come down. In verse 37, and Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed out his last. The God who in the beginning of the world formed Adam and Eve and gave them the breath of life, animated them with his spirit The giver of life himself breathes out his last in an act of worship. As the sun hangs on the cross, he is the one who has given breath to every single one of us. But because we have used our breath to worship and love other things, he breathes out his last on our behalf. And the one who gave us air in our lungs had no more breath in his lungs. I don't want you to miss this. The one who breathed the breath of life into us breathes out his last breath on the cross. But as you know, he doesn't stay dead. That his heart began beating again. That the Holy Spirit raises him from the dead and gives him new life, gives him new lungs, gives him new breath. And look what the end of John 20 says. Jesus is now resurrected, but before he ascends, he does something fascinating with this word breath. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And as he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. The one who gave us life in the garden and who lost his life in a second garden is the one who now breathes the animating spirit into our breath so that we might worship the one we were created to worship once again. Who is invited into this? Every single creature. Who can do it? Those of us who've been filled with the Holy Spirit. So what I want you to see this morning, before we, we, uh, I've got a couple application questions for us, I, I just want you to be struck afresh that this is not some generic gospel. This is not some distant God. This is the gospel of Christ who gave up his breath in order to give you breath to praise God. This is the gospel that says we will one day worship him with all of our breath, with every single tribe, tongue, and language. Here's how Revelation ends, real similarly to how Psalm 150 ends. Revelation 5, 13. I heard every creature on heaven, in heaven and on earth, and under the sun and in the sea, and all of them saying this, to him who sits on the throne... To the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Who do we worship? God alone. Where do we worship? Every single part of his creation. Why do we worship? Because of his excellent deeds and his excellent greatness. How do we worship? With everything. What's in your hands? Use it. What do you have? What's the gift that you have? Who's invited to do this? All of us those of us who are being filled with the Holy Spirit to offer praise to the one who made us. Two quick questions as we wrap up and pray that I want you to think about this week. The first is this, if, if I'm right about our misdiagnosis and our mistreatment of the problem, what do you need to do this week if you feel like you're looking around at your circumstances and not the character of God? If, you're looking, if your, your praise feels stifled because you're stuck, what do you need to do this week to be reminded of God's excellent greatness and his mighty deeds on your behalf? For some of us, it's as simple as looking back to the cross 
and saying, ah, because Jesus died for me, I can be assured that God loves me and I'll be accepted. But for others of us, it also might be what God's actually done in our lives. Perhaps it's a reconciled relationship that you prayed for a long time that God answered a prayer. Like, what has God done in your life? What mighty deed can fuel your worship today? What mighty deed can fuel your adoration and love of God? And the second question is this. What instrument has God given you that's on the shelf? If we can praise him with lute and harp and lyre and clanging cymbals and drums and voices and money and service, all of these things, how can you praise God? And what do you need to do this week to take action upon that? Do you wish you had some other gift or some other instrument and that's keeping you on the sidelines? What, like, what has God given you for you to uniquely do to pursue his glory and goodness and majesty in your life? See, all of life is worship. So this psalm, the end of the book of Psalms is saying this, we get to give everything all the time to the one who is truly worthy of our worship. Let's pray. Father, we pray that in these moments right now, that you would direct our hearts to your beauty and to your goodness. Remind us of your mighty deeds and cross and remind us of your excellent greatness. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be among us, animating us, giving us new breaths so we might praise the beauty of Christ. It's in his name we pray, amen.